Welcome to the Rebel Rebel. I'm your host, Michael Dargy. The Rebel Rebel is a show dedicated to creative rebels and entrepreneurs all over the world. It's a it's a love letter to those people who think audaciously and act courageously in service of making the world a better and more interesting place. A lot of people are finding the book and enjoying it because there's a lot of meat there. But the folks that thought it was going to be a you know, a, a happy skip through a garden are like, what the fuck? You have to set the bars almost impossibly high so that it keeps your interest. We go into Burning Man every week and, you know, kids are like, <laughs> like, that's a problem. Mike wrote a book called The Fun Habit. It's terrific and you should totally buy it. And yes, we're going to talk all about it and where it came from. But this conversation dives even deeper into all sorts of places I didn't expect to go. It's a rocket ride of stories about balancing personal passions with professional responsibilities, the importance of mental health, the impact of technology on creativity and human connection, and Mike's passion for dropping dope beats. Please welcome Mike Rucker, PhD. Mike, where are you exactly? I'm in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, I could tell by the drawl. <laughs> yeah, I'm starting to pick it up. I'm a, I'm a California boy, born and raised, and so is yeah. my wife. But uh, it's funny, the kids are definitely picking it up. And I think slowly but surely, yeah. It's yeah it's just sneaking in there. Yeah. <laughs> right on. Uh, so, uh, Mike, just to, as by way of a brief introduction to who you are and what you're up to, you had uh, put out a book fairly recently, uh, last year called the fun habit, you know, some will call you the doctor of fun <laughs> <laughs> and some do not. Uh, can you, uh, why don't you catch us up with sort of where you're at with that book? Um, you know, it, it is, you know, it's a year that was since it's been published. Yeah. It just got re-released as a paperback. So it's a nice, nice. little, yeah. Um, revival as it were, but the crux of the book, you, you know, I'm putting this research together, you know, the short summary is it was looking at happiness critically. I had been studying happiness for quite some time with a group of, of essentially an entire Congress of, of folks that were looking at positive psychology. And for folks that aren't aware of what that is, at the turn of the millennium, a bunch of academic psychologists had wanted to take tools of psychology and allow folks to use them for betterment. Because up until that point, we were really only using them for, you know, to treat poor mental outcomes, cognitive deficits, things like depression, and anxiety. We hadn't really yeah. talked about things like gratitude and mindfulness as tools of betterment. And so, you know, now it's been 25 years, but it was fairly new at that time. And at the onset, we were really just primarily looking at happiness. How could we increase happiness? Yeah. Um, the problem is, is we stayed there way too long. And we now know that you know, we have a word for it now called toxic positivity. But what happened is as we created this paradigm where we were making folks not necessarily value happiness, because there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with that, but being concerned of, you know, optimizing happiness or always worrying, you know, how do I get happier? Right. We, we created the situation and I fell victim to it as well, where you start to look at happiness as this outcome that's always kind of in the horizon. and you're here and happiness is there, you're gonna reach at some point, right? But oh. what we now know is that the brain starts to uh, ruminate uh, on that gap between where you are today and where you think happiness is. And it's an insidious slow burn, but um, a lot of people will succumb to eventually believing they're unhappy, even if you, know, if you asked me that, I wouldn't admit it, right? But yeah. that, you know, because you're not happy, right? Because happiness is, is out there. And so, um, and this isn't just conjecture, it's now been studied, like paradoxically, folks that are chasing happiness are some of the least happy people when we look at this, you know, through uh, empirical instruments. And, and again, I was there. Um, my personal story is I lost my brother, like I'd really optimized my life in the very geekiest way of like, life logging, and then, you know, uh, tracking my happiness on a scale of zero to 10 and like oh figuring gosh. out what made my most happiest days. And it, it's because I was lucky and had a good stretch, right? For a couple of years, you know, life is full of slings and arrows, but sometimes, you know, we'll, we'll have a good stretch where nothing bad happens. Yeah. And so, you know, I was having all of these good days and then my, my brother passed away. And I was like, well, you know, here are all these tools of happiness. I'm going to will myself out of this, you know, malaise and, you know, and what I did was essentially create an environment where there was no emotional flexibility, right? You need to understand trauma. You need to like, 
figure out where the meaning is there, um, right. you know, and that takes time. And, but when you're kind of living in this good vibes only mentality, right? Um, a lot of us don't do that. And, and what happens is, you know, we're just now starting to really understand what happens to unresolved trauma, but it certainly starts to manifest in very interesting ways. And oftentimes, you know, that is clinical outcomes like, you know, anxiety and depression and not really understanding how that happened, right? Because of the biological consequences of holding on to those things. And so as I tried to kind of trod through, like, you know, I'll get through this, I'll, I'll figure it out. You know, I'm still here. I should be grateful for being above ground. I didn't, you know, I didn't appreciate the fact that, no, you need to be sad sometimes, these big <laughs> things in life, right? Like, right. And, and that's happening to a lot of people. And so because I'm kind of a nerd, I also wanted to understand, well, we still want to be happy because bad things are going to happen, right? We don't want to be knocked down and not be able to get up. Yeah. Um, and then also, if happiness is problematic in these certain ways, like what are some of the things that we can do to circumvent some of these mechanisms that have become maladaptive? And, you know, what I landed on is that, you know, despite our emotional state, we still can generate things that we enjoy. And generally, when we get back there, right, so we're still spending the time to be sad, to unpack, you know, bad things that happen to us. We can still go out with a friend to a comedy show and laugh, you know, um, and create these moments of resilience where we escape kind of the shittiness of life. Yeah. Um, and then that reminds us that, you know, eventually we're going to get our footing back. But it also gives us that psychological space, you know, to process whatever it is we're going through. And so that's really the crux of the book. Holy, that's that's deep. <laughs> <laughs> and here I thought it was just going to be all fun. Just well, it's I funny because that <laughs> you, you, when someone, I guess, you know, you need to market, you know, <laughs> when you create art, right, you need to market it. But I do find that some of the, the, the criticism that is, you know, a lot of people are finding the book and enjoying it because there's a lot yeah. of meat there. But the folks that thought it was going to be a, you know, a, a happy skip through a garden, they're like, what the fuck? This guy is crazy. <laughs> what have you done to me, Mike? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's wild. So, I mean, when you're, when you're writing a book, <clears throat> I, I, I assume you have this thesis at the beginning of this thing that you're going to create, but along the way, it maybe transitions into something different. Um, I, I'm just assuming, uh, is, is that, is that accurate? Did it change? Were there, uh, I think all books have a journey, especially, you know, I was fortunate enough to, um, you get a traditional publisher so I think once you go that route, you know, there's pros and cons, obviously you lose yeah. some creative control, but you get folks smarter than you that are going to help you recreate it in a way that's accessible. So because I do have an academic background, the first manuscript was essentially a literature review and no one would have read it. I meant, you know, right. And so what happened through the course of that is, you know, understanding the problem, which I've already described, but then also how do we create takeaways, you know, tactics and things that are easily accessible to be able to change your circumstance and then also present, you know, real world examples, um, you know, so that pe people can sort of identify with certain aspects of how right. enjoyment and fun can be useful. Like one of my favorites is um, Adam Yauch of the Beastie Boys, you know, and how he was able, you know, he saw that he had kind of succumbed, um, you know, to hedonism almost too much, right? Early BC boys, that's well documented. Yeah. But as he was growing as a spiritual being, he wanted to use some of these mechanisms also for good. And so that's just one slim lane, right? Of many, but yeah. I love that. You know, here's a guy that then turned these amazing fun concerts into the ability to, you know, funnel money into a cause that he really cared about and, and make a difference. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. So and you talked to you touched a little bit on sort of where where this came from. And, uh, you know, I mean, the fun habit is certainly I mean, that's a that's a work and I recommend everybody buy it. There will be links in the show notes and stuff like that. But it, you talked a little bit about where it came from. But if you were to go back, like even further and figure out what drove you to, I don't know, become an organizational psychologist <laughs> or a behavioral scientist, like what is young Mike? You know, when did when did he decide that that was going to be his thing or? Yeah, that's a great question. So my origin story 
Uh, I got early access to an amazing mentor by the name of Michael Gervais. And so he's made a name for himself. Um, he has an amazing podcast himself called Finding Mastery, where he really digs in to performance psychology. Yeah. Um, and I had just come off an entrepreneurial failing and I needed a psychologist, quite frankly, but he, I knew he had been working with uh, high performing entrepreneurs and also sports figures. Yeah. He's way more now on the sports side. So he, he really now has made a name for himself because he taught mindfulness to um, Russell Wilson when Russell won the Super Bowl. Um, and he works with tons of other amazing athletes. He helped that um, Red Bull astronaut jump from space. Oh, yeah. 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 So he's done some amazing work, but so, you know, he influenced a lot of the direction I wanted to take and I, and I admire him, admire him to this day, but we really then did start to deviate because as I looked at performance science, I realized the one thing that we weren't talking about was the compromises that these folks have to make. So if you Right. are of the DNA that you're so driven that you want to be an elite athlete, right? Or yeah. whatever your craft is, um, that's great. And there are tools and, and great folks like Mike that can help you. But the untold story is all the things that you are going to sacrifice on that journey. And so I realized real quickly that, you know, this path that I had kind of prescribed to because I thought, you know, it was sort of neat. And for me, it was an entrepreneurial path but I was going to give away way more than I ever wanted to. And so for me, I started to slowly realize, I think, you know, the dent in the universe that I want to make is how do we figure out to keep ourselves healthy and still pursue meaningful things. And so that was the beginning of that. Um, you know, I think whenever we have folks that are, you know, gift us with wisdom, ultimately when you reach a level where, you know, in no way am I trying to suggest that I'm as wise as Mike, but I realized I had enough that I wanted to start to come up with my own ideas. And then that was paired with the fact that I also wanted to start experiencing life in a way where it was more of a tapestry. I sort of, you know, created, especially because I was overworked, a life that really had become habitual in the sense that I just grinded the day out, didn't right. find much enjoyment in the things I was doing. I was in a great place, Manhattan Beach, California. So, you know, we're, uh, you know, my girlfriend at the time was now my wife. We we're, you know, enjoying our environment, but I wasn't doing much and I was certainly missing my friends. And so in 2007, I essentially put a stake in the ground. Um, it has an awful name now in context because, uh -huh. you know, uh, I, what is it? Live, laugh, love has been so, <laughs> you know, parodied. I don't yeah. know where it, I know where I came up with this. I, I think I appropriated it from something else, but I called it the uh, Live Life Love Project because I meant it to be live a life you love. And right. now, like if I could go back in time, <laughs> and just pick anything <laughs> else. Because I that meant when it rolls off the tongue, I grimace. But, uh, yeah. you know, essentially just wanted to create a pathway where I was doing things that I felt were moving me forward. And so I just... I essentially sent out an email to my friends and said, I want to meet two really cool people every three months. I want to do something really cool. And I invite any of you, you know, to suggest it or come along with me. Um, mm -hmm. And then I want to do something where I make an impact every three months. Wow. And I think at the time, you know, everyone's like, oh, cool. You know, because, you know, oh, and the big thing that I'm leaving out is I want to do it for 25 years. Right. And the reason I kind of skipped over that is I think everyone did, right? Because, okay, yeah, you're not going to do it for 25 years, but right now it's a cool idea, right? Well, <laughs> now in 2024, I, I've still stuck with it. So, you know, I've interviewed over 100 amazing people. I think podcasters definitely relate because it's a great, yeah. you know, uh, benefit of having a, a, a podcast as well. But at the time, and, and it still is for me, I think I'm going to shift because folks just don't like long form content. Yeah. But, you know, to this day, it's still long form content. I write up the interviews because it helps yeah. me synthesize, you know, um, what I think is important. And, you know, obviously, I always share it with the guests. But it's also allowed me to have these really fun, you know, sort of core experiences every three months, because given such a low bar, right, it's not like I'm trying to do something every week. Right. Um, I can organize it in a way like, hey, this is something I really want to do. And these are the people I want to bring along. 
And now that I have kids, oftentimes I do default to them, you know, yeah. be like, hey, what is it that I want them to remember? But before them, you know, it was a neat sort of nudge to be like, hey, I haven't done anything with my best friend Micah for a long time. Like, hey, you know, let's plan something. And so it, it's been neat in that context because I, I think, again, at face value, you, you know, you do it a couple of times, it's no big deal. But the fact that it's now been a decade and a half, it's given me a rich corpus of experiences, you know, both, you know, uh, pulling wisdom from other people and then, you know, having over a hundred, you know, kind of cool things that I've done. Yeah. Wow. Give me, give me the highlight reel. Like, and you don't have to pick a favorite or anything, just, you know, things that sort of pop to mind just to give us a, some texture to what this is. Yeah, means. I think so at the beginning, my friend, uh, my best friend and I, for New Year's, our plan was always to go to every world festival there ever was. And then we both got married. He had kids uh, before me. And so that kind of petered out. We had done a lot of amazing New Year. We did Hagame and, you know, Scotland and we did uh, Mardi Gras and, you know, all these kind of cool things. So at the beginning, I guess, selfishly, it was sort of like, well, he's not in it anymore, but I want to finish this off. So, uh, you know, it, I, again, um, and I don't want to get emotional here, but the neat sort of byproduct of that was in the early stage, it allowed me to do things with my brother that was, who was living on the other side of the US, which I, you know, obviously, um, you know, we never know how much time we have, right? We have a certain yeah. amount of time, but we don't know what that is. And so, uh, you know, I don't even know that I've really thought about that for a while, but uh, so I went to Oktoberfest with him, right? Again, because it was this invitation to reach out to people I wasn't seeing. Yeah. I got to do La Tomatina in uh, Spain, which was another amazing thing that I'm probably too old to do now. I'm not sure if you're familiar. It's the, the world's biggest food fight where everyone just cuts <laughs> tomatoes at each other. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so that was kind of fun because, you know, I, I don't know if it's a derogatory term, but my wife and I were dinks, you know, double income, uh, yeah, no, no kids. Food. And so yeah. we had that privilege and luxury. Uh, and but. Since then, you know, it's been neat in the sense that, you know, things, as I already kind of shared, where I'm deliberate about how I want to use limited resources to get my kids involved in things that I feel they should be introduced to, uh, yeah. you know, uh, going to see a Giants game because it's important they understand, you know, that we are from the Bay Area and that that's meaningful to us and, and things like that. So, and then with regards to, you know, reaching out to, folks that I didn't think I would have access to, that's been really fun because uh, you probably know this, you know, um, because I, I've seen, you know, the amazing guests that you've had. In fact, I'm honored now to be one of them, but that kind of starts a snowball, right? Like I got yeah. early access um, to a couple of figureheads. I think I shared with you, you know, before we hit recording, uh, you know, I kind of had to pay for it, but through a charity, we got access to Tim Ferriss. Uh, you know, because he just happened to live in San Francisco. And once I got some of these names, then being able to book other names, yeah. um, you know, started to just become a lot easier than I thought. Like Gary Vaynerchuk, I think, reached out to me um, because he was doing that. I want to meet 365 people in 365 days. And so, <laughs> you know, my objective met with his and we just yeah. had this random phone call and he's such a character. It was just such a fun yeah. You know, where we were both walking and uh, he's so all over the place. You know, he was uh, walking the streets of one of the boroughs in New York. But like every five minutes, he saw like another entrepreneur. So he'd have these side conversations. I remember that like it was yesterday. But those wouldn't have happened without this sort of weird self-made mandate, right, to do it. Yeah. And so I think the takeaway is anybody has that opportunity to create, you know, if you want more of something in your life. Like just figure out what that pathway is, but then also, you know, reduce the barrier. One of the things I've been fascinated with this year is this whole idea of it's either hard 75 or 75 hard. Are you familiar? Yeah. I, I just learned about this yesterday. Oh, at really? the talk, yeah. At the, at the talk that I did, one of the, one of the organizers is doing that and he explained it to me. I was just like, holy crap. And so That's, good for him. Right. But I've yeah. talked to so many people that have failed because like, what a high bar. Oh right? my God. I know. <laughs> like, and I go to the gym every day. Right. But it, it's like, my bar is low. I do an hour 
at the gym every day. But this guy's just like, I got to do two workouts a day. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to drink all this water. I got to like, and I was just like, holy shit, dude. Like how long have you been doing? It? He's like, I'm on day 45. I'm like, holy shit. Like you go, but holy crap. <laughs> and I guess we should explain it really quickly. Yeah. I don't know if you want to, or I, you probably know more than I do. I just, I, I don't know yesterday. that much. I just know that it's, you know, from what I've seen, it's essentially a set of rules, you know, depending on what influencer sort of feeds it to you. But yeah. all of these, you know, to use your word, right, audacious things, but it yeah. is a huge habit stack that would be impossible yeah. for most mortals. And yet you know, <laughs> folks are trying to, to sign up because, again, you know, I, I, I've got Alan Watts DNA in me. And so this idea that we should do it for some reason yeah. you know, and live a life of martyrdom um, doesn't appeal to me, but it certainly does appeal to some. Yeah. But I haven't met anyone yet, with the exception of folks that are putting on a show for others that have been able to complete it. And so what I would suggest is, okay, one, why are you prescribing to somebody else's ideal of what, you know, is interesting? And that's, it really, really resonates with you. Yeah. Um, but two, you could create that on your own and make it interesting. Like, why not? 75 interesting for me 75 fun like yeah. things that would still move you forward right but that is more in line with things that are accessible and maybe do it once a week because yeah. that right you know again I, it's almost bad marketing to call it a low bar because some folks will be but like you know if it if it's something that's easier to do you're gonna do it yeah you know? right but there, there is there is something, though, to some people and, and I might be one of them uh, as well, where y you have to set the bars almost impossibly high so that it keeps your interest. You know what I mean? Like there, there's a and I, when he first explained this to me, this guy's name is Shane. Yeah, he'll listen to this episode. <laughs> so Shane was explaining this to me and I was just like, oh, this must be like a David Goggins thing. Like it sounds <laughs> like that. Right. Like this impossible Navy SEAL training regimen that, you know, only the very few people will survive. Uh, yeah. I, so I, again, I celebrate those people yeah. and I don't have uh, any ill will because Michael works with those people. And I think if you have Dave and, you know, Goggins DNA, yeah. um, then there's, you know, like Rick Ross is a guy that's always on his show. These folks that are ultra runners that, like for whatever reason, and I did two Ironman, so I kind of get it. You know, yeah. I did it Good in a way you. that was very Mike Rucker. Like I made it fun <laughs> and I, I just yeah. wanted, yeah, but, you know, I wasn't going for time. I think, you know, the message here is you figure out what the rules are. If it if it's motivating to shoot for the moon, um, yeah. then then do that. What I will suggest is that the research suggests that most people are going to burn out, right? Yeah. and so, and I, another thing I would attest is if you're not Goggins, likely if you do that for a 25 year stretch, right? If you're looking at the long game, eventually it's going to break. Yeah. <laughs> it's not sustainable. Yeah. So yeah. the alternative is what are the elements that are sustainable and, you know, but that will still get you where you want. And yeah, sure. like a piece of research I really like in, in the world that I live in. So my day jobs and wellness is that for most people, if you're onboarding a new habit, the most important element is making sure that it's enjoyable, at least the first six months after six months, other things happen because sure. there is, you know, this, we all change. Right. And so, you know, because fun does require some novelty, it requires, you know, you, you might get bored of it. And so they're going to be, reasons after six months that you'll need to keep you sustained right but right. as a generality enjoying what you're doing is is generally a good bet for the first six months of anything that you kind of want to you know integrate into your life for betterment and so um in that context again backed by science i would argue just at least make sure that <laughs> there's some components of, of this that you like you know i love this idea that you need to add fun to your habit stack <laughs> and, uh, habit stack is a new phrase for me so thanks for no that. but i like yeah I, i'm in, i'm familiar with it you know mainly because it is a useful tool in behavioral science um and it's really interesting i just dug into someone that's done that research like that's another thing that doesn't have a direct prescription right it's clear that some folks especially if you're not neurotypical you want the stack to be varied you know some folks that are rigid 
it has to be one, two, three, four, five, or it fails. Sure. Like I, I find the intricacies of habit stacking fascinating. Oh. But what I will suggest is I think for, you know, a majority of folks, like if you're looking at that habit stack and you're like, I hate all of this, you might need to ask <laughs> some questions. <laughs> There's some deeper questions to ask, yeah. maybe. <laughs> oh, wow. And I mean, you, you can't really prescribe, um, you know, over the airwaves with with this big blanket. But why do you think that these these habit these these things that show up in our world? Um, why, why do you think people jump onto them? Is it just a launching point maybe, or is it like, what is it that we're desperate for that we're maybe not getting? Yeah. So I've been getting better at answering this question, but it's sort of like anyone that latches on to why is obesity such an issue worldwide, right? I mean, right. you're talking about something that's so complex, right? Is it right. you know that food is more calorie dense? Is it because we're not walking because urban design, right? We can now work from home, et cetera, et cetera. So that I know that's getting us off track, but yeah. what I've found is the the same issue is complex, especially here in North America, right? So you still have, you know, Puritan work ethic that has, you know, uh, been, you know, it, it's a social norm of a lot of families. Uh, knowledge work is certainly uh, a component, right? Because we're always on those uh, notifications we get on our phone, um, and they really are tempting. And even if it's just a Gmail notification, it sucks you back in to work, right? And right. so we're kind of primed to always be on and we have no opportunities to sort of slow down the limbic system because we always sort of feel like there's something else to do, right? Uh, um, there's this aspect of, you know, we've been primed to believe that time is money, even though we know, you know, like you could make money and not sleep, but we know that's an asinine sort of assertion now, right? But it wasn't in the 90s. I mean, uh, you know, speaking of Gary Vee, who I like and who has totally come around, but in the 90s, and I didn't take the blog, blog post down because, but he told you to stay, you know, if you were an entrepreneur with kids, you know, the hustle hours are from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. And he now knows because he's yeah. seen the same science. He, I think with Vayner Media, he even has a chief happiness officer. You don't tell anybody that because eventually productivity is going to fall off the cliff. Yeah. We're learning the same thing with fun and leisure. Like there's a uh, there's an idea or it's a scientific principle called the hedonic flexibility principle. And we know folks that don't have any transition ritual between, you know, sort of productive life and then time meant for leisure, spin down and enjoyment eventually succumb to the same things that will happen to the folks that have poor sleep hygiene and eventually just get too tired to be productive. Folks that you know, eventually don't find any joy in life, you know, get into these realms of burnout that, you know, in their worst lead to things like depression and poor clinical outcomes. And guess what? When that happens, you're not productive. So these big goals that you had, you know, you just, you don't want to do anything at that point. And yeah. so again, it's a broad based answer, but what's unfortunate is, you know, it could be one or many of those headwinds that, you know, any of us face, depending on, you know, where we find ourselves. Where do you find the most fun for you? Where's where's Mike's happy place? Yeah, that's a great question. I think for me, um, right now, as I already confessed, I've been leaning into my kids. I, yeah. you know, my parents were classic workaholics. Um, they were both professors in the publisher parish paradigm. So I try to balance to make sure it's not like trying to make up for that or, you know, like I don't want to be my parents, you know. <laughs> you know, yeah. speaking of clinical outcomes. So <laughs> Um, I, I guess I'm just being really authentic with you where I saw there was a piece of that. And because it was outcome focused, you know, where I realized that I was trying to compensate, I was like, wait, this isn't the place. This is uh -huh. like still more of a have to than I get to. So yeah. I've really been like, how can I co-create these experiences with them where I'm having just as much fun as them? And we're like, we're in it together as friends and, you know, doing these cool things. Yeah. Um, and man, it's just been a game changer because now it's not a parent child sort of relationship. It's uh, in those moments, because certainly I have to be a parent. In fact, yeah. my wife reminds me of that when she's like, <laughs> you know, why am I always a disciplinarian? Um, and, and rightfully, she, you know, yeah. checks me on that. Uh, but, you know, episodically, right, creating environments where I let down my guard and enjoy that childlike state, you know, the nonlinear thinking that comes with just, you know, being. Yeah you know, uh, 
goofy, you know? Yeah. So that that's where I, I led. And then, funny enough, I don't, I keep going back and forth, but I was a DJ in college, and the idea of going back to that, uh, you know, like, I have my kids in mind, because I'm like, it'd be cool if they were too, but yeah. <laughs> uh, I've gotten back, uh, you know, to spinning a little bit, and it's one of those things uh, you can see in the back, I, I, you know, I picked up the bass for a while, and then I kind of put that down. I was like, you know, I really want to see what the kids are doing. And so I've been playing around. That's like my new, like, uh, do I want to go all in on this, you know, <laughs> like, take a course online and yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and are you old school, like with, with actual like LPs, like records or. So it's funny you say that. So, uh, there, uh, uh, he was a friend or, um, uh, I wouldn't even call him an acquaintance now, but. A uh, local hero is a gentleman by the name of Josh Davis, DJ Shadow. I'm not sure if that. Oh, sure. Yeah. Up. And uh, I just, this is hot off the presses, literally just got to see him. I was in New York for work and he hadn't toured for a long time and he played um, there. And so I picked up tickets and took my work colleagues. And, you know, he was famous with Cut Chemist, uh, you know, doing these big 45 yeah. shows, right? You know, spinning vinyl. And his whole kit now is completely electronic. So I think even these old school guys, for the most part, just because, you know, the fidelity is almost on par with yeah. vinyl, it just makes it easier. You can cue it up. And so if I'm going to invest in equipment. And I don't know that your listeners care about oh, what are I you have kidding in store, me? But... <laughs> Some of them are salivating right now. Yeah. I am right now. Like, it, I, I, I'd I love think, to have DJ uh, Shadow on the show, too, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, he's it was awesome. That show was neat. We didn't know what to expect because uh, when I was living in London uh, about 15 years ago, I saw him and it did attract a younger crowd. So I was like, you know, are we just going to be a bunch of 50 year olds and this will still be a young person's game? But it wasn't. It was yeah. music aficionados. He's done so many collabs, right? Yeah. Um, Run that, the Jewels. But, comes yeah, to yeah. Zach De La Rocha, you know. Yeah. He has new music with Q-Tip. It was amazing that he launched that. And uh, so it was fun. And But it also gave me, it answered that question. Like, no, you don't have to. Well, could you imagine that investment as well? Like, I don't have that much vinyl. I think I maybe have 12 records and they're all, yeah. I, I tend to, God, isn't it? An, for me, it's a little bit depressing that we call my favorite bands dad rock now. But, you know, like I have bad <laughs> motor finger on vinyl and tool on vinyl, like, not sure how I would pull that together with some of the things that I want to accomplish, but yeah. long story short, I think getting, um, you know, a turntable that can mix digital music is, is probably more prudent, especially where I'm at, you know, yeah. kind of back well, at the starting you, line. Man, that'd be it's so cool too. And you know what? You can get yourself a dead mouse helmet. You just, you know, do something <laughs> totally different. Yeah. Uh, but uh, dude, I, I love that. I think that's, that's inspiring. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> so it's, we're at the idea phase i'll have to keep in touch until you do, you, do you do you have a do you have a dj name no well so my dj name back in college was ruckus because you know my last name being oh, ruckus. nice so yeah. i mean why not just reboot it yeah yeah dj ruckus like it <laughs> the, the, the funtron 5000 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry no, that's good. <laughs> that's wicked. Oh man. <laughs> okay, so what is <clears throat> if you we're just going to take you uh, on a quick little walk here. You're uh you're out there in the world doing the things that you do. You're by yourself. We'll we'll just say. Maybe you've got your headphones on cuz you're you're dope as fuck and you're walking <laughs> down the street and you're thinking to yourself, "Man, I just I wish the world knew this one thing." What is the one thing that you wish the world knew? Great question. My, the thing that I'm trying to give to others is the importance of this downtime, right? And I think getting folks to understand that at least taking some time off the table for yourself to really enjoy things, you know, all of these gifts that life has to offer is as important as prioritizing sleep, that our lives really should consist of some sort of purpose. You know, we, we should be productive and contribute to the greater good. Yeah. But we should also enjoy some of our time, um, you know, and then again, get good rest. And, you know, I think that we, especially here in North America, just don't understand how important, you know, enjoyment is to our well-being. And yet 
we see what's happening, right? We're seeing record levels of burnout, you know, yeah. across all vocations. It wasn't as bad in Canada because you have better access to leisure than we do here in the States. You know, the States are second to worst in the developed world, uh, you know, at, at 10 days on average for one year's worth of work. Micronesia is the only one worse at nine oh my days. God, really? Yeah. Google <laughs> and um, yeah, it's awful. And but even worse in the states, you know, based on some of the things we already shared, because you know people are afraid to let down their colleagues. You know, even at those meager numbers, only fifty percent of us are even taking any time off a year, and that's just the tip of the iceberg, right? Because we really should be finding micro joys throughout the week. We know that you know reducing cognitive load and stopping to think about you know the things we're trying to move forward, the problems that we have, you know, just kind of being present and enjoying things outside of, you know, the commitments that we have, whether that be family or, or, you know, work or whatever it is, being able to just rest the brain while we're still awake is as important as resting the body, you know, while we're asleep. And so um, getting that message across, I think is important. You're seeing success in other parts of the world, right? Something that I, I bring up commonly is, you know, countries in the EU are now mandating really simple things like uh, work email servers can't can't continue on past 5 p.m. on a Friday to set that social norm that the weekends are meant for us and not for work, right? Yeah. You're seeing, you know, uh, countries like uh, New Zealand uh, in earnest try, you know, uh, four-day work weeks and finding out that, yes, it doesn't have much impact on productivity up or down, but you, you start to see, you know, benefits with regards to better mental hygiene, less presenteeism, right? So that those four days when they do show up, they're working much harder and, you know, able to produce the same amount that they would have if they worked five days. And now that gives them, you know, all the space to actually enjoy, you know, things outside of work uh, without any consequence. So other folks are getting it. We're just kind of late in the game to catch up. <laughs> yeah. Uh... What is, it, what is a, a, a thing that you could suggest to people that are sort of locked into this? Like, Because I think that that's, well, that's one of the problems that we have is we get locked into this mode of being and we don't know how to break out of it. And it's just like, so, you know, is it, it's not alcohol, it's not drugs, uh, or at least it shouldn't be to, you know, unsnap yourself and, okay. you know, uh, give yourself a little bit of headspace. But it's funny that you say that. I think not to geek out on the neuroscience, and I'm yeah. certainly standing on the shoulders of giants here, you know, folks that have informed me what's going on because I'm not a neuroscientist. But I think we need to forgive ourselves a little bit, right? Because as adults, especially in the world we live in now, where information is coming faster at us than it ever has, yeah, you know, there's this geeky word in psychology called heuristics, right? And so, you know, we talk about a lot those more so in the sense of biases, because it allows us to quickly sort information. But these same sort of algorithms and heuristics are used just to get from point A to point B, right? Because there's you know, so much noise that we learn to filter that out for our own survival, right? Because we need to make a complex world less complex. Yeah. But the downside of that is that we start to lose our ability to be creative. You know, we start to lose sort of our ingenuity, right, to, th to think about things. And we habituate our behavior. You know, it ends up being Groundhog's Day. And even when folks don't believe it, right, what I have them do to sort of answer your question directly is just be mindful of your last 168 hours. As, you know, it kind of sucks because it's like, yeah, the first piece of homework I'm giving you isn't that fun. Like, really? You know, it's like... <laughs> You're the yeah, fun doctor! <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, you know, being mindful of the fact that, yeah, you know, guess what? Monday through Friday is kind of, you know, you're just doing it to do it. And oftentimes even the weekends like that too, right? You just get into this routine and you do it. You know, that's part of, you know, what happens to us as an adults. And so looking at that and identifying low hanging fruit, you know, where you can potentially change your circumstance yeah. is kind of the first entryway into that. because. What we don't want to do is prescribe fun as another thing to do on your busy right. schedule, right? Like, oh, I have my habit stack. I don't, uh, but you know, this Rucker guy says that I also have to have fun. So let me, you know, add <laughs> fun to the, the oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. There, there's people out there in the world that are 
I mean, th- th- this show is all about creative rebels and entrepreneurs. And it it's, as you've, as you pointed out, it's people that think audaciously and act courageously in service of making the world a better and more interesting place. There's some people that we talked a little bit about this. Not, they don't know how to do this. And I, we don't want to add a, a fun habit to their stack necessarily. But what advice would you give to those people just really specific about to take their next step in the world? And I, yeah, I get like looking back and, you know, figuring out what just happened. Um, no, you're right. Um, I think it's as simple as being premeditated and listing down the things that you think are fun and that you want to do. Right. And so, you know, I have this available on my website, but you don't, you know, so if you, and it's free, but, um, Michael Rucker.com. <laughs> no, but I mean, I, I could just tell you how to do it. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. Some of the science of why it's important is there if you're a geek like me, but yeah. you know, really just brainstorm all the things that you want to do. And oftentimes that, like whoa and you know like i haven't seen my best friend in six months you know like yeah. wait a second i love music and i haven't gone to a show you know i love my wife and we haven't gone on a date for two months you know and so just we you know it's a common behavioral science technique but it's really accessible right like you just put it down on a list and you're like yeah. wow and then what i would do is pare things down you know some things on those lists you know might bring up kind of negative you know whether it's FOMO or whatever like for me, the common example is I would love to run the Boston Marathon, but I have a hip replacement now, right? So that would probably make it on the list and like it needs to go right away because it's not obtainable for me anymore. Um, but generally, you know, you'll find eight to 12 things that are, you know, things that you can put into play right away. And what I would suggest is just pick one, you know, like anything, you know, uh, you know, endeavor that is meaningful and figure out how you can do it. You know, if it's, seeing your friend, call them up and say, Hey, I want to, you know, let's go see the comedy show on, on Thursday. Like if, you know, if you have the means buy the tickets, cause you know, again, in behavioral science, we call that pre-commitment, but you know, just do one thing that, you know, will actually make it happen. And it can be that simple, but so many of us, right. Like, I mean, John Mulaney has a great bit about it. Like, you know, we say, yeah, you know, we need to get together. Right. And like, it just becomes this <laughs> infinite loop that never happens. And, yeah. you know, it's just a friendly nod, but we know now too, like, you know, even the world health organization has, you know, the fact that we're not doing that and that loneliness is starting to creep into this narrative as well. Right. It's an insidious slow burn. Like we're like, yeah. ah, you know, we'll find time for that eventually. And then lo and behold, right. Like, again, you know, half a year will go by and this guy or girl or whatever really lights me up. And, you know, I'm prioritizing answering my email or fucking being on, you know, Instagram. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And so those are things that, you know, once you get a taste, generally, because so many of us find us find ourselves in these, you know, this slow kind of downward spiral. Right. And again, it's so slow and insidious. If we look in the rearview mirror, we don't even realize like, you know, why am I not feeling that great? Right. Right. Um, But you get a taste for like, I want to do more of that. Right. And obviously, like anything, you know, within moderation, right, just like sleep. Right. We know we need sleep. But then you start sleeping 16 hours a day and you're like, (laughs) <laughs> like this guy said it was going to be good for me <laughs> you gotta find the balance people yeah. you gotta find the balance we're going to burning man every week and you know, <laughs> it's like <laughs> like that's a problem but um yeah yeah so like but figuring out what that is and and in an you know in a meaningful cadence that can be helpful it really starts to quickly become doable because you realize one wow, I have a lot more agency and autonomy over my week when I am making these choices mindfully. And then two, once you get good at it, you can get creative at the things you're doing, right? Yeah. Like, let's take podcasting, for instance. A lot of folks, because they did it at first, kind of habituate editing their own show, I found, like, you know, because I've yeah. been on a lot of podcasts recently. And the folks that are like, wow, I hate editing my own show. And, you know, I have, you know, the privilege to be able to allow someone else to do it just trading out that, you know, what I would call an agonizing activity so that they can get on and do something else, just yeah. swapping those things out. And that's one example, like whatever it is for you, oftentimes when you critically look at, like, I just don't want to be doing this anymore. It's just that question, you know, someone giving you the invitation to be like, right. 
Oh wait, I do have control over at least some of this 160 wait hours. Wait a second. <laughs> I, so I, I have a follow up question. Yeah. <clears throat> In my hand, I've got this sharpie, and I've, over here I've got a stack of post it notes. I am a so I guess a couple things. I'm a huge believer in writing shit down physically. Um, so when I sit down and do my list for the day, it's in a Moleskine notebook. And when I've got stuff to do, it goes on a post it note, it goes on a board. And then when I'm done it, this is a new thing that I've done. I don't keep that shit around anymore. It gets recycled right away. So I, I used to keep them as trophies. Do you know what I mean? To look at all the stuff I've done. Yeah. yeah. But, but now like, and I guess my question is, is physically writing it down still a thing? Uh, is there a, a connection between physically doing it versus doing it virtually? I, so for me, I'm more focused on the behavioral science aspect, you know, just mm -hmm. as someone that could give advice. So in both my studies of folks that really have figured it out, even, you know, high functioning folks, it's really that pre-commitment. I think the system um, is gonna be what's useful for you what uh, i will nice. say that has you know people i don't know the gentleman and again similar to taylor swift it's right on the top of my tongue but i'm not going to remember maybe you know the guy that's married to the founder of spanx oh my gosh yeah no i don't <clears throat> it doesn't come to mind right away so i think he has a similar message to me but he um has been marketing this big ass calendar i believe he calls it and folks swear by it right and they do exactly what you just described he oh. sells you this big calendar um, and it's meant to really give you, you know, be mindful of, you know, your time and to make sure that there are some fun things integrated into your day and you can see it all at once. Right. So all that's right. not my idea, but it certainly suggests that what you propose um, is, is helpful to some folks, because I know folks that have um, found my work are like, this guy's doing similar stuff and it's super cool. Have you heard of this big calendar? Yeah. And so I think, right. you know, one we do know, and I am familiar with this science, that the act of writing things down is poetic, right? Like it, it, it invokes more of our cognitive resources than, because we right. just learned that that, you know, isn't, um, you know, for folks that aren't watching, like just type that word. <laughs> <laughs> just imagine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was really but, uh, great. One of the best yeah. I've seen, actually. <laughs> yeah, so I, you know, I, I'm sure, uh, with regards to you already knowing that it works, there's there's benefit in that. Gotcha. What it, um, just to sort of tie tie things up with a uh, a really complete picture of Mike. What's on your bookshelf? Like, what is it that you like to to read? I'm assuming you're a reader. Uh, yeah. I mean, I didn't want to be that guy. Do you remember during the pandemic where there was a whole Twitter feed on? folks that were trying to look cool by having bookcases behind them. So oh. I purposely, like, it was so amazing. <laughs> I hope it still exists. I just went, cause I didn't want to be that guy. And, yeah. uh, but I have a full library. I mean, I, I love books. And then there's also some research to suggest similar, let me geek out on this and then I'll get back to your question. But yeah, yeah. Um, there's good research both for um, having fruit bowls and then having books that you don't even, to be um, positively influential on your kids. Like for whatever reason, even if you don't have them read them, just yeah. the fact that they look at books all the time correlates. <laughs> it's really fun research. So again, I, wanna, <laughs> I um, believe that. Yeah, so I like it, 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 it sets the stage. So I'd like, and um, I don't know if you're familiar with Ramit, the guy that wrote, I'll teach you to be rich. He talks about this too. Like, I think it's a great way to support creators. So, you know, a lot of creators have all these expensive courses and, and things that I found that when I purchased them, you know, oftentimes I, I don't engage in them, but to give yeah. somebody 20 bucks because I liked their message and, yeah. you know, um, so if there's anybody where I've ever liked anything, you know, a podcast or whatever, I generally support them. Um, what I will tell you is that I, I tend to like things that go deep. So. Uh, when I'm asked what is the most transformative book, it, it's Sapiens by far. That book was just like blew my mind. Are you familiar with it? Yeah, I'm familiar. I haven't read it though. So he essentially goes, but I do know that you love story, right? And yeah. he essentially goes through all the mechanisms of how we became a civilized society. But in the journey of taking you from hunter-gatherer to where we are now, religion is essentially a bunch of stuff that, you know, I don't, you know, 
but right people have created because even if you believe in one then yeah. you, then you're believing the other ones are you know i don't want to get sure. all ricky gervais but right like, yeah. <laughs> you know and money is made up like it's not a real thing although yeah. we, you know and certainly it's important in our life but like you know like the games that have been played with money you know we we oh, yeah. made it out of paper it's this creative thing that has pictures and like right and yeah. government like the fact that companies are a thing here in the states they're they're treated as a entity yeah, right as an and, individual yeah yeah so here are three huge things that we essentially just said they exist <laughs> and rule our lives you know and so i'm don't believe in manifestation or all those things but i do think in the context of folks that think we might be living in assimilation like even if that's not you know true in the sense of elon musk's version yeah we are in the context that the things that bind us to each other we made up you yeah. know and so one, once you kind of understand that one you take yourself less seriously right like eh, you know yeah. I, mean, yeah, I still got to play by the rules but we made we're these making, rules up yeah. yeah we're making this up as we go along anyways <laughs> exactly so. and you and rooted in kindness right i still believe that there's whether we are living in a computer, or God made us or whatever, you know, I, I don't have a dog in that fight. But I do think that whatever this is, kindness binds us, right? Like we do need to be kind to each other to survive, even if you believe in weird ethical things like hedonism, right? Like it's clear the golden rule sort of needs to exist. Yeah. That then you can start playing with some of these variables, right? You can, you know, I love this idea of finite and infinite games, right? You can decide you know, even if you want to be a Goggins type character, you can figure out what's the finite game I want to play with these variables, you know, and then oh, yeah. understand there is an infinite game. There's a long game. And in the, con it, you know, why that's important to my work is that I do, there's a, a concept called uh, time affluence. And it's clear that folks that value time as much as they value money. So they understand that, you know, we only have a certain amount of time. We don't know what that time is, but like understanding that this is a resource we really need to use wisely. Yeah. Um, you know, in conjunction with everything we already described that, that you start to make better choices because it's like, okay, I can start to have fun with this, but it is a long game. Right. And that I n need to make choices that kind of lead to my betterment, but episodically, if I want to kind of get weird, you know, as long as it's rooted in <laughs> kindness and, and doing no harm, I can. And, um, and and you really do start to take yourself less seriously because yeah. you just look at it like, okay. And I, I, it also is an invitation to me. It's opened up more awe and wonder because then I look at nature, right? And I'm like, this is not part of all that nonsense, right? right. This isn't the one having the answer emails or worried about money or, you know, worried about where my kids are going to college, you know, which is another institution we made up. Um, it's like, holy cow, like this is just happening. Like either there is, you know, a benevolent creator or, or like science is just, you know, amazing yeah. and crazy. And um, <laughs> like lately, this really weirds me out, but just like, you know, they're, folks way smarter than me that say if there is a god he's a mathematician and you can start to see that in nature right like oh sure yeah. and uh <clears throat> i i just yeah we got off the rails again but i find that <laughs> fascinating but I the reason it. i have access to that is knowing how much of just you know the things that we do that bother us were essentially you know, made up yeah oh that, that's a great way to extrapolate yourself <laughs> That's outstanding. Mike, this has been outstanding. What a conversation. Holy crap. I, I know it was going to be fun when we met the first time. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> I, I, I really, so here's an invitation. I would like to do this again, uh, you know, sometime down the road and, and not in the too far distant future, but maybe after a couple cycles where you've gone through and, you know, done some cool and weird shit with cool and weird people. <laughs> um, but yeah, this has been so much fun. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I've been your host, Michael Dargie, and this has been the Rebel Rebel Podcast. It's a podcast for creative rebels and entrepreneurs all over the world. And hey, if you're a rebel or you know a rebel, why don't you head on over to the Rebel Rebel Podcast.com and fill out our guest request form. We'll get back to you within 24 hours and maybe we can share your story with the world. Don't forget to like, share or subscribe wherever you get your favorite podcasts. And thanks so much for listening. Until next time.